Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. And thanks to uh, Sheena for that fantastic talk. It's a hard one to follow, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so uh, as Darren mentioned, I, my name is Brooke Foucault-Wells. I use she, her pronouns. And I am an alum of the MTS program here at Northwestern. So it's a special honor to be invited back to talk a little bit about my work today. Um, Darren uh, graciously plugged the book already. So um, if you've heard my name, you probably heard it in the context of this book. Uh, so together with my amazing colleagues, Sarah Jackson and Moya Bailey, uh, we published a book um, sort of inauspiciously in March of 2020 uh, about online activism. And in this book, we examine the ways in which uh, marginalized communities come together around the organizing principles of a hashtag in order to agitate and advocate for social change. Uh, my piece of this is the network science and computational piece. Uh, we use a bunch of methods inside the book and inside our work more generally. Uh, but my piece is to extract the uh, tweets, turn them into networks, and then look for interesting examples of the community lifting up certain kinds of voices. And in doing this work, we often find again and again at the center of these networks, the ones getting the most attention um, and the ones getting amplified the loudest are young people, often queer young people of color. Um, so those are the folks really creating the social change behind the movements like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Girls Like Us, and countless others that have created dramatic shifts in the way we talk about race and gender in the United States. And so uh, after the publication of the book and on the heels of COVID and the assorted other uh, dramatic political uh, complications that came with that, uh, we became really interested in those youth activists. Um, so, so my team and I were interested in the ways in which these activism, what started as activism, started to transcend into mainstream politics. So of course, we've all heard Black Lives Matter, and we know that it started within black communities as a way to rally support and then eventually advocate for change. And it eventually became so mainstream that it was literally painted on the street outside the White House. Right? Um, we see lots of cases of this happening. So folks advocating uh, for gender rights, young folks advocating for gun control. And these things have started to become so institutionalized that they are creating changes in law and policy. And we also have wonderful sort of internet-born examples like Gen Z for Change, which among other things um, has engaged in or rallied collective action around things like the anti-abortion laws in Texas. So they're the ones who crashed the Texas TIP hotline. Um, so this made us wonder, how is it that the internet has changed the dynamics for young people and how has it changed the way that they engage specifically in electoral politics? Um, there are a couple of competing narratives in this space. So there is this narrative de of decline, uh, and this is one of those hegemonic narratives, we believe, that Sheena referenced, where young people are apathetic, they don't really care about politics, there's this crisis of participation in democracy, and this is supported with metrics like voter turnout, news consumption among young people, engagement with institutional politics, so working for campaigns, donating, and things like that. We sort of reject that narrative. Uh, so we, we think that that is not true, um, evidenced by all the work we see young people doing in online spaces and in offline spaces as well. And we tend to lean towards the more participatory uh, view of young people's politics in particular, advanced by Jenkins and others. This has an emphasis on sharing, social connection, building coalitions, so those kinds of support systems that you find around hashtags and other online-based social movements. Um, change happens through discourse, so not through making policies, but by changing hearts and minds. Um, and it's less reliant on these kinds of formal elites and institutions. So, so in many cases, young people specifically re reject those formal elites and institutions. And it happens to be very well suited to social media. So this kind of collective action uh, really thrives in spaces of creativity um, and connection that we find online. So uh, together with my graduate students, we are really interested in um, how young people are participating in political discussions on social media. And we break down participation in two ways. Um, so think about participation in terms of voice, where voice is the act of posting, right? So the act of saying something at all. Um, so the more people post things about politics, the bigger their voice. 
And then we also operationalize attention. So attention is having other people interact with your content. So we have all, anyone who's on social media, particularly platforms like Twitter, has probably had the experience of posting something that didn't get much attention at all. Now we think when people are sort of in their formative stages of developing political identity, even that posting matters. But certainly the ones who get a lot of attention that become at the center of these viral hits and so on, um, there, there's something interesting and different that's going on there. All right, so we have um, a, a pretty special and, and bespoke data set that we have access to, thanks to our colleague David Lazar at Northeastern, where we have two million Twitter handles that are matched to US voter registration records. And what this gives us is that we are for sure that they are real people and not bots, which is a challenge in any online research like this. And we also get the demographics attached to their voter registration. So this is age, gender, in many cases race, um, and political party if they've indicated one. Um, so this tool lets us do some really interesting things like break down uh, political voice by age. So from that, we gathered all tweets that the panelists put out, panelists of any age between November 1st and 15th of 2020. Um, it's a, a little more than 18 million tweets. And you might remember this was a particularly potent time in American politics. <laughs> um, and then we used a, a pretty standard set of keyword classifiers um, to identify things that were about the election and tweets that were not about the election. And you know, it's about a two to one ratio, okay? Um, spoiler, uh, we ended up hand coding about 16,000 tweets and I'll show you why in just a second. <laughs> um, so um, these are charts that show the uh, proportion of election, a uh, proportion of election related voice and election related attention relative to the proportion of total tweets. So the way to read this is if something falls to the left of the line, there is relatively less of that in the election content than we would expect based on the volume of tweets in that age category overall. And if it falls to the right of the line, there's relatively more. Um, and I will draw your attention, ah, there we go. Helpful lines illustrating. I'll draw your attention to that youngest category. So these are the kind of young people that we see in the activist networks and so on. And uh, this is bad news, right? <laughs> so we see relative to the proportion of tweets that they put out in general, they have way less political voice and way less political attention. Now, uh, you know, we don't have agendas as scholars. We let the data lead the way, but um, this makes me sad. Right? Uh, so so this, this really confirms that kind of uh, narrative of decline, that young people are not participating as much as older people online, just like so-called, uh, or so they say, they're not participating offline as well. But this also just didn't square, right? So our most interesting research problems come when we have a finding that doesn't square with our lived experience and our observations in the world. And so we coded 16,000 tweets. Um, so the first thing we asked is how, uh, how effectively are we capturing young people's political conversations with these standard computational methods? Um, so these are the things that everyone uses when they're doing online analyses of political voice. And so we downloaded uh, you know, the top, I think it was 0.1% of tweets. So that was about 16,000 tweets across all the age categories and hand coded them with a team of coders. Is this about the election, yes or no? Um, the good news is that the, the false positive rates were pretty low. Um, so if these classifiers say, hey, this is about politics, they're probably right. Uh, so we can reliably use those classifiers to identify things about politics. But the bad news is uh, the false negative rates were high. Um, so a lot of times things were in fact about politics and it wasn't getting caught. And of note, they were highest in those younger age brackets. Um, so we do a worse job of capturing political content that was created by young people than we do of political content that was created by older people. Not great. <laughs> so uh, what is it that they're doing? Uh, you know, I'm happy to share the paper with you that goes into all the dimensions, but wanted to give you a little flavor of where these computational tools might not be doing the best job. This is no surprise, I bet, for any of you who are kind of active as young people on the internet. Um, so there is a lot of media. So, so we did try things like OCR for text um, to try to pick up on some of this stuff. But what ends up happening, uh, you know, so we have here a, a picture of President Obama and now President Biden um, that says, house party tonight, my new crib, DM for Addy, right? <laughs> so this is a joke um, about Biden going to the White House. 
But even if we OCR that text, we're not going to pick that up as uh, political content because the, the computer can't see uh, Biden uh, and Obama together. And even if it could, it's not clear that it would identify that as uh, you know, political content. Um, in the back here, you might be familiar with this meme if you're sort of an internet person. This is like a toddler throwing a tantrum and there's some uh, commentary uh, over, um, a voice commentary over the top about, about Trump leaving the White House. Uh, we also see a lot of memes. Um, so, so memes are the kind of language, the connective action of, of the internet. Uh, and so Orange was ejected, a meme from a popular game at the time. And then a lot of uh, kind of wordplay with these election maps. So, so things like this would show up at the frog um, as a timeline cleanser because people are kind of obsessively watching the updates on those electoral maps. Um, and then a lot of emotion. So, so um, we saw these really lovely examples of people doing caregiving. So acknowledging that people, especially young people who are often the kind of victims of terrible policies, uh, were experiencing a lot of distress. So, so um, you know, pictures like this would come up with for all the black kids or for all the queer kids, here's um, something to lift your mood. So people are acknowledging that politics are important and also stressful, especially in a time of uncertainty where uh, you know, the difference in the election could have wildly different implications depending on your identity. And so I don't want to take up too much time because we want to have time for Q&A. Uh, but some of the takeaways um, that are important are that social media, of course, enable and enhance participatory politics. So thinking about our research and our political research, uh, we really have to embrace this idea of participatory politics as important, common, and especially relevant for young people. Um, youth participatory politics does appear to extend beyond activism and protest, which are important, right? Look, I'm, uh, you know, I'm an activist myself. I've made a career out of studying activists, but it transcends into more electoral issues, so the, the kind of like classical American politics. And this participatory politics is common, important, and needs much more attention. So, so that's my, for the computational types in the room, um, that is my call to action, that we, we need to do better jobs of picking up on this stuff, and or we need to work on these interdisciplinary teams so that we don't reify this narrative that young people are not participating in politics. And so, because it's talk about the internet, um, I have <laughs> a, a meme to leave you with. Um, so you are the audience. I hope you will turn towards participatory politics and away from this narrative of decline. <laughs> Thank you to my team. Of course, I uh, uh, can't do my work by myself or without funding. So I'm grateful to everyone who helped. <laughs>